It says it's now streaming on Facebook. There we are. So uh, thank you everyone who is watching along on Facebook Live. Um, we're streaming our talk today. We're going to give a few minutes um, just for folks to kind of get, I think we're right at two o'clock. So maybe we'll um, just give it a few minutes till we really get into the meat of it. But my name is um, Eric Corvath. I'm the Director of Communications and Marketing at the College of Engineering. And as part of Engineers Week, we're speaking with uh, two of our faculty members here who um, about how their disciplines um, have been either responded to COVID-19 or can help us chart a path forward after the uh, kind of help build a post-pandemic world. So um, as an aside too, I wanted to, to really point out that responding to COVID has been, I think we've seen the last year, requires partnerships and hard work from a vast number of disciplines and, and industries from you know essential workers to medical professionals to developing vaccines uh, to really a slew of other, other work. Um, this talk today though will really focus on how engineering concepts tied to these two uh, faculty members and, and kind of how that has responded to COVID. So wanted to keep that, that scope in mind. Um, so I wanted to first introduce uh, both the panelists who we've got spotlighted here. Um, Dr. Brookstein is our Senior Associate Dean and Professor of Mechanical Engineering. Um, Dr. Brookstein's research interests are largely in, in textile engineering and you know, one of the projects I think he'll, he'll illuminate today is his work on, I've been describing it kind of as an early DIY uh, mask kind of face covering solution uh, with a filter insert that, that really worked on early, I would say probably April or so of 2020. Um, and then Dr. Julie Drzmalski is our director of the industrial and systems engineering program. Um, Julie recently shared some of her expertise um, with the Philadelphia Inquirer about how systems engineering concepts um, can really help power vaccine distribution in the city of Philadelphia. Um, Philly, like a lot of a lot of places, has seen kind of fits and starts about getting um, vaccines shots kind of into the arms. Um, so while we're broadcasting today too, uh, we'll be checking uh, the Facebook comment feeds to see if any com or comments or questions come in. Um, but largely, we'll just kind of um, go back and forth a little bit and uh, talk to, to Dave and to Julie um, and see how those disciplines have either responded to the pandemic or, um, as Julie said, kind of help us um, chart a path forward. So I want to start, um, and I do want to mention, too, we have some visual aids that, that both have shared to help kind of give uh, a visual component to, to what we're talking about. So we'll cycle through those first but um, or later. But I, I wanted to start with, with you, Dr. Zuzmalski, and talk about your research interests, which really center on supply chains during crisis situations. And this is something that we've seen, I think, a, a lot with COVID, even before vaccines, you know, when when things roll in, in kind of last year, gross shelves, so that was, a, that was a big issue. When stay-at-home orders were, were implemented and kind of drawn out, I mean, a lot, there were stories about, you know, uh, home exercise equipment, you know, there's shortages of getting bicycles that people couldn't work out because they were, these things were tied up. Um, so it's been everything from, from that heavy demand to now we're seeing the kind of the stress on vaccines. Um, so you recently wrote this op that we talked about how kind of systems engineering concepts could help really tighten up a, a disjointed process of getting vaccines that we've developed. You know, we have the, the Pfizer, the Moderna, and, and Dave, we were just talking about you know, the potential Johnson & Johnson one-shot vaccine coming out. But can you give kind of a brief overview of how industrial and systems engineering concepts can help kind of get us to a better vaccine distribution process? Sure. Um, so if you think about the pandemic, it is just, and if we can just take a step back for a second, the pandemic is one large complex system, right? So actually, if you can pull up that second slide, the next one. Yeah, so it affects every aspect that you can think about, right? I mean, it's easy to think about how it's affecting education or the population health or, or the healthcare system, but even the environmental system, right? So, you know, not having enough um, sanitation workers to pick up trash affects the environment in a negative way. Um, but having more people work from home affects it in a positive way right? because less people are driving. So, we need to think about this um, from a, a complex system perspective. And so what Dave works on, you know, the masking is just one 
subsystem, if you will, of helping to eradicate this disease. And like you mentioned, the vaccine is another subsystem. Um, and so you're right, it, it has appeared disjointed, uh, at least from an outsider's perspective. Um, it seems like there's no centralized effort. Um, we see clinics popping up every day. There's multiple queues that you can get in online to, uh, to sign up to, you know, to get the vaccine. And so we're looking at an issue of supply and demand, right? This is a, a supply chain. And ideally you'd love them balanced, but we know that that's not going to happen. Um, even with the mightiest of efforts, we'd never get there. So from a supply chain perspective, we can put some immediate efforts into place to help kind of smooth out that imbalance. Um, and so it's really what I was looking at is a three-pronged approach. And one of those prongs is real-time monitoring of the system. And so what do I mean by that? You know, things that we can not go back in and um, start over and do it as in an ideal fashion. But we can take the information that we get um, on a daily basis or a weekly basis from each of these um, administration sites. And we can track things like what percentage of the people reneged on coming to their appointment. Um, where are we drawing these people from? Are we so we know now if we're targeting the entire population or just a segment of the population? Um, what percentage of people don't show up? And and I don't mean they don't show up because they don't want to get the vaccine, but they show up because they've been registered on multiple sites and maybe we're lucky enough to get multiple appointments. And so um, you know we want to minimize the number of doses that get thrown away. Um, and we want to maximize the number of people that get vaccinated. Um, I actually, I read something just yesterday that the CDC is um, anticipating that 10 to 15% of the doses will get thrown away simply because um, they can't be used. You know, they've been taken out of their refrigeration because we have such strict requirements about that. Um, that's a huge number that, that, you know, that people can't get vaccinations, but that, that we can help that. And so, um, what percentage of people were getting through 1A and 1B now So in the city? So what percentage of people um, actually returned for that second dose? The, that kind of information, what we can do with that is now we can dynamically adjust where we send the vaccination, you know, the vaccines rather, um, you know, what sites we send the vaccine to, and then also how we staff those sites. Um, so it can help us, you know, kind of smooth out some of the um, imbalances that we have between that supply and demand. It's kind of like um, the grocery store when they have to forecast how much milk they have to buy, knowing that there's a snowstorm coming or predicted, and maybe there's, you know, a holiday. And so they want to minimize how much they're going to throw away. And so IFEs deal with this uncertainty all the time. That's, that's what we do. And so we have these techniques in place to be able to forecast out and, um, and better allocate the vaccines. Um, we have optimization tools that we can use that um, can you know, more dynamically adjust where we are administering and how we're administering them. Yeah, and I think you made a good point about the, the current vaccines and, and with, the, with the milk comparison really, right? It's really the way they have to be stored, it's also a perishable item in a lot of ways. So. I don't know if there's a way that that you can pinpoint to this, or if this, how we can describe this data point. But um, the 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 net loss of those vaccines that you said, the 10 or 15 percent, is there a target number? Ideally, that would that target number would be zero, right? Every single shot would get into a waiting arm. But is there a realistic number that says, well, we'll you know, in a perfect world, we'll only lose two percent or five percent? Is there a number, or is there a way we can get there? I have not um, I have not read one about um, a particular number. And you know, it, it, the way it, in general, uh, we, we do have um, numbers that we set. We have metrics that we set for the percent that, and we design our system based on those metrics. Whether the CDC use that, I, I would assume that they um, definitely, you know, when they're thinking about how much they have to produce, uh, it's, it's going to be most definitely um, there definitely was a number, um, you know, that, but what they, what they predicted, I don't know. Um, I think that 10 to 15% was not, I, you know, I would say maybe definitely under 10%. 
Yeah. But I don't know what it would have been. Yeah. Um, Dave, I want to ask you about the mask research and work that you've done. So I mentioned very much early in the beginning, it was about April or so, um, really sort of this like early days of, of COVID, but not just early days of COVID, but kind of the public consciousness, right? There was a lot of confusion about, um, you know, face coverings, who needs them, when they need to be used, what is an N95 mask, who needs to use the N95. Um, so you worked on the, the design that I described earlier that used essentially common t-shirt fabric and a filter that at the time was kind of readily available um, yeah. to use to create a mask design that was shared with um, Cat School of Medicine that was kind of used, they worked with volunteers to assemble and distribute these masks um, in and around to help com to, to, to mitigate community spread. Um, I wanted to see one, how can, how can you share kind of how that design and project came together, but also there's, there's an example that you shared earlier about um, the, the same way Julie mentioned about, you know, the perishability with milk, there's a three-legged stool kind of concept here where, where mechanical engineering comes in, right? Sure. Well, you know, it's, it's hard to believe, but it's only been a year ago when this thing first, uh, we first, first recognized there was a problem. And at first, a lot of people don't even remember this, but uh, Dr. Fauci actually suggested that people don't wear masks because at the time there was a limited quantity of the N95 mask, which is the mask that uh, uh, healthcare workers use. There was also a limited quantity of surgical masks. And in fact, um, uh, the Surgeon General, uh, Jerome Adams went on um, a website uh, from the CDC and he showed people how to make their own masks from common fabric. Well, I'm a textile engineer and I've been involved in protective uh, clothing and, and protective items for many years. And the minute I saw that, I said, uh, this is not a good idea. A, a, a couple layers of t-shirt fabric, that's not going to work. It's just not going to work. But that's, that's all we had. And, and, and Fauci was, was telling people, don't, don't even wear masks but, because he didn't have the information. I'm not blaming him. But I had some background and I said, no, wait a second, there is something we can do. And uh, if you go to my um, uh, the design thinking slide, I identify, design thinking is something that we use in engineering today. It's more than just solving problems. It starts with identifying the need. The need was clear. We needed masks. And, and even though the, there wasn't any data out there that a uh, couple layers of t-shirt fabric would not be any good, since I have worked in the area, I knew right away that's a prescription for failure. And uh, if people just start wearing that, it's not going to do much. It might help a little bit, but not much. At the same time, I remembered that um, I had recently changed the filter in my uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. And just bear with me for two seconds. I, I bought... I, I use these filters called filtries, which uh, are in my heating and air conditioning system. And they're made by the same company, 3M, that makes the N95 mask. So I did a little research and I realized that the fabric that's in that filter for your HVAC system would probably work in a mask. So we had to build a mask. And I did that. And if you go to the slide, Eric, what has the, the pictures of the mask, uh, the one, yeah, there it is. So what I did was I still use t-shirt fabric, but now what I've done is I've now, I harvested out this fabric from the HVAC and I inserted it in the mask and I came up with a, a simple system to use grommets. And there I am with the mask on and there's a cross-sectional view and um, I made these masks and I made them just for family and friends. Well, word got out. I wrote a little uh, story about it. And next thing I knew, the uh, dean of the medical school got in touch with us and uh, asked for the design. And he uh, got uh, a group of volunteers to make over 15,000 of those masks uh, to give out to uh, residents in, uh, around the hospital. So remember, this is April, May, when you, you couldn't buy a mask today you can't miss a mask advertisement. Um, and they're, they're all over the place now, masks. But April and May, they weren't. So I, if you go back to my identifying the need, I identified the need. 
And then I did a lot of research by looking at what the patents that 3M had for their masks and looking at the patent that they had for their HVAC filter on, I realized then I could come up with a mask. So I did that. And uh, then I finally stopped when people started realizing you need some kind of filter in there. And now you can buy masks with filters. There's a whole range of them. And I've done some research on this. The difference between uh, a mask with a filter and without a filter is, is, is dramatic. So if I could give one piece of advice, don't buy any kind of mask that you see advertised that doesn't have a filter in it because it just doesn't do enough. Now, um, can I just talk a little bit more, Eric? Sure. So then I realized, wait a minute, the filter is good, but it only filters out the virus containing particles. It doesn't, in a virus, you don't kill a virus, you deactivate it. It doesn't deactivate them. And that's when I realized the best mask would be a mask that both filters and deactivates. So if you go to that slide, Eric, you know the one I have that little, no, 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 that, uh, no, that one. So we have the mask that I made and then the mask that you can buy on the market. All they did was capture, which is very important. But the really, the gold standard was, and by the way, the N95, all that does is capture. The N95 mask does not deactivate viral particles or bacterial particles. The surgical mask doesn't do that. So I said, well, then we got to find something that both uh, captures and reacts and deactivate it. And sure enough, um, you know, the marketplace uh, paid attention to that. And now you can buy masks that do that, that both capture and deactivate. So that was the progression um, using design thinking and then realizing that you had to go beyond just capturing viruses. You also had to uh, react and deactivate them. So that was a question I thought about. I wanted to ask as a follow-up before, but I think it's you made a good point where, you know, as the vaccines roll out, masks are clearly going to be a component in in popular culture for a long time to come. Regardless, we get to, you know, herd immunity and and whatever percentage that the public is vaccinated, we're all still likely to be wearing masks. So do you see this design or another one developing even further? between now and say, you know, next March, where we'll have masks that can, you know, be even more advanced than what we have now, or we're just gonna well, be, we're looking for more wider adoption. Whatever. Well, there's always, um, I, I'm convinced there are some masks now on the market that do the capture and the reacting, and I'm not gonna, um, uh, you know, uh, what's the word I wanna use? I, I'm not gonna endorse a mask. However, I will tell you that I wear this mask here. It's called the Synovia mask that has a, um, uh, nanoparticles in it on the side here that deactivate um, the, the virus. And I also double mask. I wear this along with an, an N95. The CDC on February 10th came out and suggested that everybody double mask. And whenever you see Dr. Fauci on TV, you see President Biden on, on TV, they're double masking. So uh, I strongly suggest you double mask. The, the N95 will filter the Synovia mask will both will filter and deactivate. Uh, but to your question, uh, there was just an article in the New York Times either today or yesterday that said COVID-19 is not going to go away, just like the common cold has not gone away. But what will happen is as these vaccines start uh, coming around, um, it'll make it where like the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, they say no one who took it has gone to the hospital and certainly they haven't died. So it'll be a controllable um, uh, virus, just like a cold is or something else. Having said all that, I personally am planning on wearing a mask the rest of my life. And, um, and I'll probably never shake anybody's hand again because the, these viruses that are here now and they'll be emerging viruses, there's possibility someday maybe bioterrorism. I wanna always have ready a mask that both reacts and captures. I, I think uh, those days are gone where we're not walking around masks. And, and the proof is in the fact that the, 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 the traditional flu numbers for this year are substantially lower than they've ever been. Well, I think that's because a lot of people are wearing masks and they're not shaking hands. So, you know, there's the proof in the pudding. I'm wearing my mask even when I get my vaccine a year from now, two years from now, I'm going to be wearing a mask. Now, I might not be obsessive 
I might not be walking around, like when I come into the building every day and there's no one here, but I still have my mask on. Well, probably once it gets under control, I'll come in, assuming no one's in the building without my mask on. But uh, when I go to the Wawa, I'll, for the rest of my life, I'll be wearing a mask when I go into a Wawa, even when COVID's under control. Mm -hmm. Now, I think you made a good point, particularly about the double masking too, because I, I, for me, I, uh, you and I talk, you know, speak about masks a, a little bit just by, you know, dint of, of, you know, our positions, but we've also seen celebrities or people in positions of authority modeling this behavior. So, you know, at, at the inauguration on January 20th, you saw a lot of officials double masking and that, that was the first, I think, time that I saw it kind of enter into the public lexicon is, all right, now you start seeing articles of why are we wearing two masks here? Here's what it means. Um, Julia, I wanted to go back to um, what you were talking about with um, the original kind of supply and demand conversation and, and going back, I'll, I'll actually go back to this slide, but um, you know, of all these, these systems that interact, there's also the kind of um, function of the social, social system that just the supply being dramatically increased right away, right? Last week, we saw that the, the federal government had announced that there was this enough supply that they've acquired to vaccinate, to have, I think the number was 600 million doses on hand to vaccinate almost every American. So how much of a, of a where does that leave us? So, you know, before that, that point, how much further down the road are we now in, in terms of your modeling? How, how good of news was that? Well, I mean, certainly it's good news that we have the vaccines, um, but, you know, in terms of trying to plan, um, it makes for a very um, complicated supply chain. You know, when, when you set up a vaccination site with, uh, you know, it can only, because of distancing and, and just capacity limits, it can only handle a certain number of people a day. You have scheduled your providers uh, you know, and so now all of a sudden doubling the number of doses that you have to administer, you know, it's, you know, it, you have to uh, think quick and you have to figure out how you're actually going to get them without throwing them away. Um, and so I think, you know, maybe they had knowledge of this beforehand, but this goes into something we talk about in supply chains, which is, you um, you know, maybe these organizations had the knowledge a little bit ahead of when it was released to the public that they were going to you know, get double the dose or whatever it is. Um, but there's, it's a lack of communication. I think that that's been one of the central focuses here. And um, that, that's a big issue in supply chain. So you think about a game of telephone, right? So by, you know, when you might say something, by the time it gets to the very end, it's completely distorted. And the same thing happens in the supply chain by when one organization orders something, by the time it gets to maybe the raw material supplier, that information is completely, it's actually amplified. And so um, to answer your question, you know, that, that requires um, dynamic scheduling, dynamic, um, um, flexi a lot of flexibility um, having a lot of flexibility in the system. And these are things because we didn't really plan it ahead of time, or at least it doesn't seem like we did. Um, we, we don't necessarily have the capacity to overcome that, I think, right now. Um, you know, and hopefully we will be able to, um, but that's, um, it's not a lot of visibility and transparency. And, and that's one of the things um, that we don't have in the supply chain. In fact, you saw that visibility, that lack of transparency and visibility when um, we had, the, when we faced a shortage of medications and medical equipment. So remember back you know, in the beginning, um, almost a year ago, we couldn't get masks and we couldn't get uh, all those things we had a shortage of. And the reason for that is because those are sole sourced. So they're sole sourced from China. And the reason they are sole sourced from China is because other places are not willing to be transparent. So to divulge where they're producing it from and where they're getting their materials from. And so then when China was shut down, went under lockdown, we couldn't get that material. So if we, what we need to do is we need to, you know, put capability in the system to enable organizations to be more transparent. Um, and the reason they don't want to is because they, you know, they think they're gonna lose some competitive advantage, um, understandably. 
but since they don't, then they can't get FDA approval. And so, um, so I think, you know, having flexibility um, in the supply chain is great, but we don't have the time to prepare for that. There's been a lot of comparisons to the, the last major flu pandemic, and, and particularly I've seen a lot of, of stories sharing you know, that they had, you know, vaccination, um, not just centers, but they had people going out, you know, individually one at a time into, into neighborhoods. Are there lessons that you can draw from, you know, your work from that, that situation to today or things that you've taken from COVID that you can say we can apply to? Because clearly, like Dr. Brookstein had said, you know, there's possibilities with masks or bioterrorism and future pandemics. Is there a single lesson or a couple of single lessons that really stand out for you that we can uh, draw from the past or something that you're really taking away from now that you're thinking, boy, this is something we have to learn from? Yeah, I think um, one of the main things is that we have to realize that humans are at the center of this. Um, and when we design things such as a vaccine rollout, um, we need to understand that these are humans that we're dealing with. And everybody responds to messaging in a different way. And so, you know, some people will uh, take the advice if it comes from a clergy. Other people will need to read it in a journal article. So the messaging needs to, be, needs to be different and it needs to be clear and, um, and done in the right way. And so um, I think, you know, we have information. Do you remember back in the beginning, there were these systems models that they would put up in the screen and they're kind of like what if scenarios. So if we all social distance or if we all wear masks, this is what it could look like. This is the case, what the case count could look like in three months or six months. Um, those are system dynamic models. And, you know, we've been building those models for 70 years. <clears throat> they started at MIT, actually. And so we have data. We don't really have pandemic information on how humans interact. We think we might, but it was 100 years ago. So I think um, now we have some more information about that. We can better those dynamic models um, and realize that we really have to take the human into the equation. In fact, um, there's a really good example of this. So the CDC had hired a distinguished um, consulting firm to develop this vaccine administration management system, which, exam, which I don't know if a lot of people have even heard about. And it was intended to be this sort of universal administration site for registering for and getting your vaccine. And uh, there, I don't have the exact number, but it's very few uh, municipalities are even using it. And there's a lot of reasons. And one of them has to do with the stability of it. Um, it's online um, that, that we can probably overcome. But it was um, not really designed, you know, Dave talked about the first step of design thinking is know your customer essentially, know what your customer requirements are. And that's the first step in uh, systems engineering as well is know what your customer requirements are. And, you know, as engineers, we tend to think about the, the more uh, mechanical specifications, but you have to know who you're building it for. And anyway, this, getting back to this BAM system, it was built, it has very tiny check boxes. It has in a lot of steps to go through, a lot of clicking. Um, and it was a very small print and it was gray, it's hard to read. And so who are the first, you know, who are the first people that are gonna use this system? Well, it's the people in 1A and 1B, you know, and a lot of older generations. And um, using the system actually, it just required a lot of like, micro dexterity to kind of, check those little boxes, um, which people with arthritic fingers can't do. And, you know, just the, the font that was very small. And so it was not built with the customer, customer in mind. Um, and so I think one of the key takeaways is that we need to really model in, the human into the equation. And that's a lot easier said than done. It's very difficult to model it, but I think now we have this information about how humans react and we can use that to better those system dynamic models um, and hopefully um, mitigate some of these problems in the future. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And, and Dave, I wanted to get back to, I know there was the visual that, that you had mentioned earlier about the stool that, yeah. you know, just how this, this kind of all fits in, because like I said in the very beginning, 
you know, we have vaccine development, we have masks, we have getting the vaccine out. And there are other components of this, but I want, I was hoping you can kind of speak to yeah. your, your general thrust behind this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we, we both, both uh, Dr. Drzewalski and I made it very clear that mechanical engineers play an important role in uh, mitigating uh, the effects of the virus in terms of developing masks, um, I'll go back to the school, and of course, vaccine distribution. And now, so remember, this is, this is engineers week. And I'm very proud to be an engineer, and I'm sure Dr. Jasmalski is too, because while most of the focus, the national focus, is, well, I shouldn't say most of it, is, is on vaccines, the vaccine development, for the most part, seems to be kind of on the wane right now. There is some concern about the variants, will the vaccines work, but we got through that hump fairly well. But we're really, uh, the, the vaccine distribution right now, everybody knows it's a mess. It's a mess. And um, I think the industrial systems engineers will play an important role in cleaning up that mess. And with the face mask, you can always make a better mask. And it's not just me working on masks. I, I read almost every day another research paper on face masks, where in April, last April, there was hardly anything. Um, so engineers play an important role in, uh, in COVID-19. And, and in the future, like I said, there's going to be other viruses. There's all kinds of things that are going to happen. And we were clearly caught flat-footed when this thing came around. And I'm, I'm not going to get into all the politics. It's not necessary. But we were caught flat-footed. And we're paying the price. 500,000 people are dead right now. And that number is going to keep going up. And it was probably unnecessary. One other point I'd like to make. Uh, I want to dispel a myth. I mentioned double masks. Even when what they were single masks, I would hear people say, I don't want to wear a mask because it affects my oxygen supply. I'm not going to be able to get enough oxygen. Well, early on, I bought a simple pulse oximeter, which you can buy at the local drugstore, which measures your blood oxygen. And uh, while I'm, uh, uh, I'm not an Olympic athlete, I'm still, um, I do exercise. I'm, I'm, I was, at the time I did this experiment, I was 70. I, I uh, put on my, one of my masks and I measured my blood oxygen and I um, then uh, rode my bicycle uh, down the shore for an hour and had the pulse oximeter on and kept watching it. My blood oxygen level did not go down. And I, um, I haven't done the thing down the shore with the, uh, the, um, the bicycle because it's too cold, but I have checked my blood oxygen when I double mask. There's no variation there. So when you hear uh, people say, oh, it, I, I can't wear a mask because, you know, it affects my breathing. No, it doesn't. I mean, you might think it does. You might think it does. But when you actually look at the numbers, it's not doing that. So there's no reason why not to wear, certainly not to wear a single mask and even to wear a double mask. Um, your body will tell you if you really don't have enough oxygen. Your body's very sensitive to how much oxygen it has in it. And you'll start getting lightheaded and you, you conceivably pass out. I don't know anybody, I've never heard of anybody that's passed out wearing a mask. So I want to, I want to really make a point to dispel that myth. These masks do not um, uh, cause your oxygen level to go down. I've heard people say, oh, I, I, I have carbon dioxide. And no, no, none of that's true. I'm not a medical doctor, but I've done my own experiment. No, not true. Double mask. So I, I want to ask one more question um, to Julie and really to put a fine point on, on something else, but you know, other ways that industrial and systems engineering kind of res talking about responding to things that are not just pandemics and crises, but you know, maybe leaving on a, a bit of a higher note of, can you give me an example or two of other kind of tangible things that industrial and systems engineering or systems engineers would work on that would be kind of something that someone could really look at and say, oh, I get this now. Not related to the pandemic. Right, anything, positive news. <laughs> well, sure, I mean, we can work in any um, field. So if you think about industrial engineering as being, so it, it is a merge of two fields. And so industrial engineering really teaches you the, the tools that you need so things to be able to optimize a system or design a supply chain. Um, those are the tools that you get from the industrial engineering. Um, and then we go and we apply them to systems. So we can apply them to any system. So 
um, if and what we do is we say, aim to optimize. So we don't always can, we can't always optimize, but we aim to optimize the system. And so, um, if you go back to the systems, the that one, um, we can apply those tools to any of these subsystems, right? So, um, just take. Um, well, we won't talk about the healthcare system, take the environmental system, right? We can use that to, we can use those um, systems engineering principles, that systems thinking approach to the environmental system. And we can use it to, um, you know, maybe reduce or improve um, the quality of the water. Um, you know, you can, you, can, you can use those tools in any, Fashion. I mean, you can use them in uh, the financial markets. You know, if you want to go um, optimize your return, right? You can use. We do use those tools um, to be able to do that. And so, um, I think that's one of the, the that that is one of, one of the reasons I like it so much is because of its um, ease of use. You know, you often think about it working in distribution, um, not really often in healthcare. Um, and when I say working in healthcare, also to give you another example, so, you know, the healthcare system, you know, we, you know, you think about just getting patients through and things like that, but it also can be something as um, micro or, or minute or small as just um, understanding how disease progresses through the body, right? So we can actually, and we do, we model those in um, queuing systems and things that we can use to um, understand how disease progresses through your system. Um, so it's, it's amazing to me the range of applications that we can have. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I think that really kind of helps illustrate the kind of broad nature of the study. And I think you've both given us a, a lot to think about, particularly with now that we're, you know, approaching where we are with this, that it's been, you know, when this kind of first rolled out in, in February and March of last year, a lot of that confusion and, and, and fear was through lack of information. And now there's there's data and there's information that informs future decisions. But um, I want to thank Dr. Brookstein, Dr. Drzmalski for both um, joining us and kind of sharing your experience for this Engineers Week panel. Uh, we will be saving and um, uh, sharing this for viewing at a later date. But if there are any other questions that come through, um, we'll always you know have um, contact information for both of them on engineering.temple.edu. Um, but that wraps it up. I want to thank you both again and have a happy rest of Engineers Week, everyone. Uh, can I say one last thing? I sure, said at the end of every one of my lectures, no matter what class I'm teaching, wear your mask. Wear your mask, or they say mask up. It's something you can do and make an impact for yourself and for the community. Always wear a mask and make sure it's over your nose. Don't wear a mask that's underneath your nose. You're not doing anything there. We'll close it out with that actually visual right there. Thank yeah, you so much for is. modeling the behavior. Yeah. Always wear over your nose and mouth. Great. Well, thank you both again. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks.